Hi, I'm Eden. And I'm Nicole. Welcome to Roadside, Roadside Horror, Horror Show. Show. We are not in a state this week. I almost said we were, but we're not because this is a refuel. I guess that is a kind of state if you think about it. But It's a state of mind. <laughs> yes, perfect. Yeah, so we decided to give ourselves a little bit of a break and instead of talking about some of the items and stories that we tell, we've been telling each other about states, to really go outside the box and kind of pluck some tasty tidbits, I would say, from just our knowledge of like true crime, paranormal stories to create a fun little trivia game for ourselves and hopefully for you guys listening. Exactly. The only thing that I wish would happen that's not happening is I wish that we were in person and I wish there was a third person and that we had buzzers and someone else (laughs) could read the trivia questions and we could buzz in. (laughs) I mean, that would be super fun. I'm very quick on the buzzer. Yes, me too. I I can add a little ding, ding, ding noise. Oh, that'd be fun. To our correct answers and perhaps a want, want noise for our incorrect answers. That's perfect. (laughs) All right. So since I have more questions than you, I think I will start. All right, let's do it. Okie dokie. Question one. Who was the first serial killer in recorded history? Ooh, that one's tough. Uh, gosh, recorded history? I mean, oof. I'm, uh, is it, is it that French guy? Is it Gilles de Ray? Is that what you have? Oh my God. Yes. Yes, it is. I was like, well, you're right with French guy, but I want a little more. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's Gilles de Ray. That is exactly who it is. That's too funny. I also had a question about Gilles de Ray as well. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Okay, so for those of you that do not know, Gilles was born in 1404. He was a Breton nobleman who had quite possibly witnessed the death of his father during a tragic hunting accident, which may or may not account for some of his crazy. His mom also died from unknown causes that same year, too. So that's a lot to deal with in one year. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He was, by all accounts, a pretty interesting person in my book, though, because he watched over Joan of Arc in battle. I know that's what like totally attracted me to this little historical serial killer is the fact that he was a notorious serial killer, but he also protected Joan of Arc during the Hundred Years War. Exactly. Yeah. And apparently he was very good at his military job because he was appointed as a Marshal of France, which is like a very, very exclusive high honor for uh, the French military in the early modern era. Exactly. And did you know that like... um... But uh, Joan of Arc, she was like 12 or 13 when she went to war, by the way. I did not know she was that young. I knew she was a teenager. But... Yeah, she was very young. And she doesn't look like Lily Sobieski. And I was upset because I saw that movie with Lily Sobieski. What? You don't know about that? Yeah, I think it was a made-for-TV movie about Joan of Arc and Lily Sobieski played her. Weird. I'm only familiar with like the, um, what was it, the, the Luc Basson one with Milo Jovovich, The Messenger. I don't know that one. Oh, yeah. She has a real serious haircut. It's very like, I feel like while she may not look like Joan of Arc, she definitely has Joan of Arc's bowl cut haircut. The bowl. Yeah. Okay, good. Because that's what I was going to say. Joan of Arc has a bowl cut. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but a little bit after Gilles de Ray stopped uh, protecting Joan of Arc and she was unfortunately burnt at the stake. Mm-hmm. Um, he retired from military life. And then I, I encountered a lot of stories about how like he was kind of extravagant with his wealth where he would just yes. do these like huge parties. He would dabble with the occult. He ended up um, kind of irritating his family members and his the family he comes from is actually a very prestigious French noble family that has married queens of France and, oh, yeah. uh, you know, princesses from England. And I guess he was such a notorious like I don't know what to say, bon vivant, but, uh, you know, spendthrift that his uncle refused to leave any of his possessions, like his armor or any of his wealth to Gilles. And he actually left it to his younger brother, Rene. Oh, I didn't know that. And what was that first word that you said? Uh, bon vivant. I don't know what that means. It's, it's, it means good life or trying to lead a good life or excessive life in French. Okay. I don't think that's bon quite is good. That's all I know. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's not quite an accurate description. I think spendthrift is kind of, or hedonist, whatever, however you want to label Gilles Doré. Exactly. And 
Do you know how he uh, went from being a nobleman and war hero to being a serial killer? Only a little bit here and there. I read about the accusations against him. So all these children started to go missing from around the castles that he owned. Yes, I said castles, plural, because like you said, he was quite the spendthrift. (laughs) And um, they seem to be linked to him and his servants. So... One day in 1437, some people witnessed Gilles' servants disposing of the bodies, but they were all too afraid to say anything, and he didn't even get caught or get in trouble until 1440 when he was caught kidnapping this priest, which was completely unrelated to the other shit that he was doing. Oh, my God. That's crazy, because I know, you know, at that time in the 15th century, if you were a peasant or you know, a poor noble person and you're, you had to send your kid off to you mm-hmm. know, work, you probably wouldn't see that child again. So how would you even know anything happened to them? So that, that's and, truly horrific. And that was a big thing. Like a lot of these kids were in that situation. So people didn't even realize they were missing until way later. Um, so they took him to both ecclesiastical and regular court for heresy, sodomy, and, you know, killing over a hundred children. And they were like, hey, so we know that you did it. And if you won't talk, we're totally going to torture you. So he was like, no, no, thanks. Not not into that. I'm just going to tell you. And he confessed to torturing and killing all these kids. And he'd have his servants kidnap them for him. And that's where that all started. And he was also sentenced in a weird way, which was death by both hanging and burning at the same time. That is super weird, and, and I mean, I I am always fascinated by the by the medieval slash medieval, early modern period of like the supreme overkill. Well, oh like, yeah, we're not just gonna do this one way to kill you. We're gonna super duper kill you. They really wanted to make sure he was dead, and now he's like revered in churches for like being penitent. Yes, that's like a weird thing. So like the ending of his story is like, yes, he confesses under threat of torture, admits to killing all of these like poor poor boys, and. Because I guess when he was being burned or before he was executed, he addressed the crowd and explained how sorry he was Mm -hmm. and that he will ask God to forgive him because he knows what he did was wrong. And apparently everyone was like, wow, Jesus saved him. (laughs) So Exactly. Yeah. I'm like, that's just nuts. How many killers on death row are just like, I found Jesus. Right. It's like, d- did you though? Um, did you find any in, any of the info about uh, how maybe Gilles de Ray could be possibly innocent? No. So I thought this was kind of interesting, and this is very, very modern, like early twentieth century uh, to through the late twentieth century scholarship. Okay. But and it kind of goes across the board. Like Al- Alistair Crowley questioned like the involvement of how. It was not just ecclesiastical, but also secular authorities in Gilles' mm-hmm. case. And he said that in almost every respect, uh, Gilles was a male equivalent of Joan of Arc. And his main crime was that he was trying to pursue knowledge by learning more about the occult. Um, other people have speculated that his crimes were wildly exaggerated, and it was at the motivation of some of the political forces surrounding him and the land he owned. So the idea that if we can, you know, get Gilles de Roy out of the picture, we can operate and work more seamlessly with some of his relatives when it comes to, you know, providing uh, money for the crown and things like that. And we all know how the witch trials went. So that makes mm-hmm. sense because people are motivated in that way by money and your land and, you know, just getting you out of the picture. Yep. But also Aleister Crowley is a fucking nutcase. So <laughs> very true. Who knows? And most most historians kind of reject this theory. Even though his land would have been forfeit, it actually didn't go to the church or the crown. It stayed within his family after his trial. So that kind of shoots a big hole in that theory. Yeah. But yeah, I think it was interesting that people are like, well, maybe not. And it's like, no, no, for real. Yes. If it's not going to mess you up too much with the order of your questions, uh, what is your Gilles question that you wrote down? My Jill question is actually number one as well. And plus the other little tidbit that I thought was super cool and makes a lot of sense is that Gilles de Ray was the, is believed to be the inspiration for the French folklore tale of Bluebeard, which was recorded about mm, probably 150 years after his death. Okay. I can see that. 
makes a lot of sense, right? Yeah. Where it's like, okay. I mean, if you like, I can go right into number two because you already knocked number one for me out of the park. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Yeah. Go to number two. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Uh, this is a true or false question, Eden. Okay. So tell me, true or false? Wes Craven wrote The Hills Have Eyes after learning about the legendary Scottish cannibal clan of Sawney Bean. I think I've heard this before, and I'm going to say true. It is true. Yes. Um. So uh, – Wes Craven learned about this story that appeared in the Newgate calendar, which is a tabloid publication from like the 18th and 19th centuries. And it was all about a man named Alexander Bean, who went by Sawney, who was born in Scotland in the 16th century. Um, he didn't like his lot in life and he realized that he was not fit for work. And so he left home after meeting a woman named Black Agnes Douglas, which is like Black Agnes. What a great spooky ass witch name. It is. I like it. <laughs> and Agnes was my grandmother's name. Nice. Nice. Black Agnes was locally known as kind of a deviant and a layabout and also was accused of being a witch. So her and Sonny kind of took off for the hills. Uh, they robbed people along the roads in their area of Scotland and even ended up cannibalizing one of their victims. And after that, all fucking bets are off with these two nutty kids, wild in love. Uh, they ended up <laughs> <laughs> they ended up finding a coastal cave, and this cave was really deep. It was like two hundred yards deep. And then when the tide came in at high tide, the entrance was blocked off, but it was deep enough so that there was still dry area inside. So they were effectively hidden at high tide. And the couple ended up living in this cave for some twenty five years. Oh, my God. Right? So that's a long time to go. Uh, they ended up having many kids. They had eight sons, six daughters, 18 grandsons, and 14 granddaughters. Wow. Now you might be asking yourself, where do the grandkids come from? And they oh. are indeed the products of incest between their children. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, so... Now, we know that the Bean Clan didn't work, but they basically would just waylay travelers. They would always ambush people at night. They would rob and murder the people. And then they would bring the bodies back to their cave where they would dismember and eat them. They would reportedly pickle the leftover human body parts in barrels. And then some body parts they would discard on the nearby beaches so that it looked like maybe wild animals had, you know, attacked these travelers and that was the cause of it. So this goes on for about 25 years. And then there is a local fair that's going on. And the Bean Clan decided to ambush this couple. Now, what they didn't know is that the man was very skilled with a sword. And he managed to fight off his attackers. But that wasn't before his wife was pulled from the cart and dragged off by the beans. Um, the husband managed to escape when a large group of fairgoers appeared along the road and scared the beans off. Now, the fairgrowers took this this man who was attacked to the local magistrate, and he told the magistrate of what happened to him and his wife. When the king of Scotland at the time, most resources say that it was James VI, learned about this attack, he rallied a bunch of troops, as many as 400 men and bloodhounds to go with them, to hunt down this cannibal clan. They ended up finding the Beans Cave and apprehending them. And then there's two versions about what happens next, depending on which you're, you know, source you're looking at. The most common one is that they were captured alive. The beans gave up without a fight. They were taken to Edinburgh in chains. And then they were either taken to Leith or Glasgow and they were executed without trial because people thought they were so gross. They were just subhuman and didn't really deserve a trial. Uh, oh, Sonny. Man. Sonny and his sons and grandsons had their genitalia cut off and thrown into fires, and then their hands and feet were severed, and they were allowed to bleed to death. And apparently, oh. while Sonny Bean was bleeding to death, he said, quote, it isn't over. It'll never be over. What the fuck? Yep. Okay, so, I mean, yeah, these were not good people, but mm -mm. holy shit. Yeah. That's uh, really harsh. Um, they okay. also... They also uh, made Agnes, his daughters and granddaughters, and the other children watch the men die before they were tied to stakes and burned alive. Oh, Jesus. 
Um, the interesting thing is a lot of historians say that the way that the Bean clan was supposedly killed is very similar to how you would execute men and women differently for the crime of treason. So men would basically be drawn, hanged and quartered and the women mm -hmm. would be, you know, burned. So I'm like, that's interesting. Uh, the other ending to the story of the, the Sonny Bean clan is that when King James and his men found them, they were so horrified. They decided to bury the clan alive and they put a bunch of gunpowder at the entrance of the cave and set it off to collapse the cave in on them. Holy so, shit. Yeah. So that's what Wes, Wes Craven learned about. And I think you can see a lot of those parallels in like in the, the Hills Have Eyes for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, definitely not one of my favorite movies, but mm -mm. that backstory was pretty intense. I know, right? Nuts. Nuts. That's crazy. And I mean, I can understand why they had all those kids because there's not much to do in that cave, I'm sure, besides fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's dark in there. But yeah, so that's that's I always found the Sonny Bean tale very fascinating. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have a true or false question for you. Oh, cool. Hit me. So true or false. There's a place in Yellowstone National Park where you can commit murder and technically cannot be tried for it. No way. I'm going to say false. That's too crazy. It's true. What? <laughs> I need to know where this spot is so I can either avoid it or get there if I ever have to. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so there is a 50 square mile area in Yellowstone called the Zone of Death where you can technically get away with murder. As we know, Yellowstone is in Wyoming, but this 50 square mile area is actually in Idaho. Huh. Due to the Sixth Amendment, it is your right to have the jury be composed of people from the state where the crime was committed, which would be Idaho, and from the federal district where the crime was committed. Well, that federal district would be in Wyoming. So oh. the jury would have to be made up of people who live in the Idaho portion of Yellowstone, which no one does. So technically, you can't be charged for the crime there because no one lives in that part of the park. Well, you can be charged for it, but you can't be actually, you know. Tried by a jury yeah. of your peers. Interesting. What a weird technicality. Exactly. And there is some portion of Yellowstone that's in Montana, but mm -hmm. the Montana parts people actually do live in. So that doesn't count. Hmm. I wonder if anybody's ever tried to, like, use this loophole as a way to get away with murder. I'm assuming someone has. But Otherwise, how will we know that about this little fact? Exactly. Yes. Unless someone's just really into law and has a lot of time on their hands. <laughs> so I just thought that was crazy. There is a place where you can get away with murder. Yeah, that's nuts. That's nuts. In I, Yellowstone. I, yeah. Be come see the beautiful natural landscape of America. Don't get caught in the ring of death. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No zone of death. Zone of death. Nice. I just thought that was insane. I learned about that recently. Like I saw it on a TikTok actually, and then I had to do my own research and find out if it was true or not. And it's it's true. I mean, it's not like a guarantee or anything, but it's it's seems pretty solid. Hmm. Very interesting. Thank goodness for TikTok, learning all kinds of new weird things and recipes. Oh, exactly. And recipes has been my, my recent thing with TikTok. I just found some things that look really good that I can't wait to try. I know. I know it. All right. So for my next question, I think you'll, you'll get this one totally. But what actor starred in the movie The Fugitive based on the life of Sam Shepard, a neurosurgeon accused of murdering his pregnant wife? Oh, I've never seen The Fugitive. I know of the movie, and I think I've seen parts of it, and I cannot remember who the hell was in it. So I don't know this one, guys. Oh, no. It's Han Solo himself, Indiana Jones, Harrison Mr. Ford. Harrison Ford. Yep. Oh, my God. Okay. My sister's childhood crush. <laughs> I'm surprised then uh, you haven't seen this. <laughs> no, I haven't. So The Fugitive was, was a movie that was based on the life of Dr. Sam Shepard. There was also a TV series as well. And it's a really interesting case if you've ever looked into it. Basically, Sam Shepard was a very successful young doctor. His wife was pregnant. They had friends over one evening and he fell asleep. His wife escorted their friends out 
and then he woke up, you know, later that night uh, to hearing his wife being attacked. He ran upstairs and saw this figure over his wife. He got knocked unconscious. He woke up a short while later. His wife was dead. And he chased somebody, an intruder, out of their house. He was struck again in the head. And then he woke up in the early morning hours and called for help. Well, the media circus around his trial got so bad that it was one of the first trials where the American legal system really looked at ways to protect people who were on trial from getting their cases tanked because of media attention. Uh, He was convicted of her murder, and then he went through an appeal process and a retrial with none other than uh, F. Lee Bailey as his lawyer, as one of F. Lee Bailey's uh, early cases. And he was eventually exonerated. Let's just say he wasn't found guilty at his second trial. Um, To this day, there's lots of speculation about who actually killed his wife. It could have been a handyman. It could have been um, also a drifter who was also in the area at the time of his wife's murder. Uh, The interesting thing about Dr. Shepard that I found out was after he got out of prison, he ended up getting remarried and his father-in-law was a professional wrestler named George Strickland. And Strickland oh. was like, Hey Sam, you got to reinvent yourself now. You can't go back to being a doctor. Um, he had lost his skills as a neurosurgeon. He ended up drinking pretty heavily. And a result of that was that he, he was no longer safe to be a surgeon. So he's kind of looking for something to do. And his father-in-law convinces him to become a professional wrestler so weird at the age of 45 he debuted with the wrestling name killer sam shepherd oh no i mean (laughs) you want to distance yourself from that shit what i know like he really leaned into it i would not have made that choice but okay no yeah it's crazy he ended up wrestling over 40 matches before he he passed away and um he was only active for about six to eight months And uh, the interesting thing is that his notoriety made him a really popular draw to these wrestling exhibitions. And the last fun fact that I was like, what is that Dr. Shepard used his anatomical knowledge to invent a new wrestling submission hold. It's this particular hold called the mandible claw. Uh, It was popularized by the professional wrestler Mankind, a.k.a. McFoley, in the 90s, where, like, you basically take your your ring finger and your index finger and you, like, shove it into somebody's mouth and, like, press on the bottom of their mouth. And then you can use their thumb to press uh, on the outside of of their jaw and use that as a submission hold. Like, I always, I'm like, oh, that's the Mankind move, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But apparently that was invented by Killer Sam Shepard when he reinvented himself as a wrestler. I was just like blown away by that. I'm like, that's so crazy. I'm like, Harrison Ford should have wrestled in the fugitive period. <laughs> I, that Yeah. I never knew that. And I, I just have so much to say about this right now, because first of all, it's so weird. Cause like, I do not watch professional wrestling anymore, but when I was a kid, you know, mm-hmm. I watched it all the time. So yeah, I knew that move from mankind. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah. And then also, I'm just so surprised that he went with Killer as his name because it just really. Yes. Like, I would want people to forget about that whole thing. I wouldn't want to remind everyone, but I mean, mm-hmm. it was good publicity, I guess. Do you know who he was with? Like, which was he with, like, WWF when it was still WWF? Or was he oh, with WWF? No, was... Or like a. This was way before uh, those leaks were those? around. Yeah. So okay. th- the murder happened in like ni- the mid 1950s. And oh, okay. he debuted, uh, he was released from prison in 1966. And then his wrestling debut is in 1969. And by April of seven, 1970, he was, he was dead. Oh man. Okay. Yeah. M- mostly from years of alcohol abuse. Um. So yeah, it's very interesting. Huh. Well, I mean, I don't blame him for the alcohol abuse with all the other crap, but. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. There, there's tons of uh, interesting documentaries out there about Sam Shepard just because his case was so high profile and just very exceptional for for its time. I think it's one of those cases that gets, you know, that label of like crime of the century or trial of the century. If yeah. You look into it. So, yeah. And also, although I haven't seen The Fugitive, I have seen a very, very dumb um, parody movie of it starring who else but Leslie Nielsen. Um <laughs> <laughs> called wrongfully accused. 
I do remember that one. It has some good lines, but most of the movie is complete crap. As always, with those spoofy movies. (laughs) So I got a question for you. Okay. And this was brand new knowledge to me, so I'm not expecting you to get this one at all. What Slavic monster is the soul of a woman who either committed suicide by drowning due to a troubled relationship with a man, or was the victim of drowning most of the time at the hands of a man because she was pregnant with a baby he did not want? Hmm. It's like something straight out of a murder ballad, but huh. A Slavic monster. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know a lot of Slavic monsters. It sounds like it's like some kind of like Kelpie, but that's definitely not Slavic. I don't know. No, but you are close. Um, it's called a Rasolka. Oh, Rasolka. Yep. So Rasolki, which is the plural, are female spirits that aren't too far off from those lady in white stories we've mm. been discussing on occasion. Mm-hmm. Uh, these women were abused somehow by a man in their life and either ended their own lives to get away from it or died at the hands of the man by being drowned in the water by him. Uh, now, in the afterlife, they become vengeful spirits who pretty much kill any man they see. If you're a woman, however, you're completely safe. I mean, that makes sense. I was curious. I'm like, so what happens? Did they take vengeance on the asshole who uh, murdered them? Or it's like, oh, no, any guy. Any guy will do. I can Anyone project. with a penis, they're dead. <laughs> um, so, I mean, but if you're a woman, who knows? They might even, you know, kill that loser ex-husband of yours, you know? Might help you out a little bit. This really only came to be their story as of the 19th century, however. And for those of us that suck at remembering how that works, that would be the 1800s. The earlier version of them are actually linked to Slavic pagan traditions, and they were seen as benevolent water spirits. Hmm. That's interesting because I do kind of initially I was like dryads, nymphs, like all of the no dryads are tree spirits, like like nymphs, naiads, naiads. Thank you. Are mm -hmm. the water ones. Interesting. Rasolkas. Rasolki? Wait, how's the plural? Uh, Rasolka is singular. Rasolki is plural. Rasolki. Interesting. Yes, they they do fall into lines with other things, like I said, like the Lady in White stories or um, like other mythological creatures from other areas, like you said, Kelpies and stuff like that. But I had never heard of them before doing this research, and I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, for sure. I feel like in a weird way, now bear with me, it's one of those mythological creatures where if you are a woman, you could lure a man to water and then like terrify him with the story of the Rasulka gonna, that's going to come and punish him. Mm-hmm. But at the flip side, too, is that it probably also protects women because I don't think a man would want to necessarily create a Rasulka either. So exactly. Maybe it's interesting and good. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> interesting. All right. Well, I have a multiple choice question for you. Okay. And multiple choice makes me overthink. So here we go. <laughs> Put that overthinking cap on, Eden. All right. In what decade did Londoners descend upon Highgate Cemetery to hunt down a supposed vampire plaguing the neighborhood? Was it the A, the 1890s, B, the 1930s, C, the 1970s, or D, the 1990s? I'm going to go with the unlikely one and do 1990s. Ooh, good guess. And close, but no, it was actually the 1970s. Okay. The 70s were definitely a weird time. I was shocked when I realized that there is a vampire hysteria that happened as late as the 1970s. (laughs) And that's weird because, like, when you said the first one, which is in the 1800s, the 1890s or whatever you said, Mm -hmm. um, that's the one that initially was like, okay, it's going to be that. Then I noticed all the other ones were the 1900s. So I was like, well, that's obviously the throwaway answer then. So what do I go with? (laughs) And then the the overthinking did its job. Exactly. (laughs) So a little bit more about the high high. It's called the uh, Highgate Vampire. So Highgate Cemetery was the it is it's still there. It's in North London, 
And it was like the hot resting place for wealthy Londoners in the 19th century. It's one of those really beautifully landscaped graveyards that was built more along the idea of a memorial park. And it has all these intricate, beautiful like tombstones and like gothic battling with all ivy everywhere. And there's like really famous people buried there, like Karl Marx and the novelist George Eliot. So, okay. I've heard of the cemetery. Yes, it's very popular. I want to say, is it mentioned in Bram Stoker's Dracula? It very well could be because that was the time period where Highgate was a very popular uh, burial it's ground. Possible. I know yeah. it from somewhere. And it's weird with Bram Stoker's Dracula to like actually read the book versus watch the movie. Mm-hmm. Everything's done in like letters and diary entries. Right. So it's like a very weird way to narrate a book. Yeah, and you get to leave a lot out, and you get to have different narrators who only know parts of the story. So, mm-hmm. exactly, pistolatory novels always a pain in the butt. <laughs> but Highgate is interesting because by the 1970s, it was pretty run down. A good chunk of the the middle of the the 20th century, it was overgrown, kind of crumbling. It wasn't in the best shape. Uh, things reached a fevered pitch in the 70s, though. Uh, because over like starting in the early 70s people started reporting sightings of this like sinister dark figure some people said they had blood red eyes other times they were just described as like a man with a cape basically what you would picture as like any kind of like that dracula style vampire right people Mm -hmm. would start reporting this Uh, a lot of people just kind of wrote it off because it's a spooky ass old crumbling cemetery so of course you're going to think you see things as you're walking around but then neighborhood pets started disappearing and sometimes the bodies of uh, cats and dogs were found drained of blood around. Oh, exsanguination is always fun. Exactly. Well, this stirred up a bunch of locals, uh, including one man, a self-proclaimed magician named David Ferrant, who wrote that he had glimpsed a gray figure with that he was certain was supernatural and that several other concerned residents of the neighborhood also had seen this figure. And they'd all written into the same local newspaper. And he said, I'm going to go out and find this figure. Well, he wasn't the only one. And a rival savior appeared, uh, a man named Sean Manchester, who claimed to be a, an exorcist, vampire hunter, and bishop of something he called the, quote, Old Catholic Church. Weird. Yep, yep. So these two guys start talking about how oh it's a it's definitely a vampire uh manchester goes so far as to say that the people of highgate aren't witnessing earthbound apparitions but this is a vampire and i will stop it and they kind of start this media feud where they start calling each other like hacks and fakes and it stirs up even more interest in this these highgate vampire sightings so much so that it triggers this hysteria (laughs) when both Manchester and Ferret declare that they're going to venture into Highgate and destroy this creature. Uh, they decide that they're going to do it on Friday the 13th. Of course. Of course. The 13th of February, 1970, uh, which also was the same date that the Thames TV was going to run a program all about how this saga started. And they were going to include media coverage of this vampire hunt. So they do, within hours of the broadcast, dozens of quote-unquote vampire hunters descend upon Highgate Cemetery with homemade stakes. They're coming from all over corners of London, and so many people flood the cemetery that the police get called and they end up setting like a setting up a cordon, like a police line around the cemetery because they start finding weird things in the cemetery after this. Okay. Over the next several months, they find disturbed graves. Uh, in August of that year, they found a woman's century-old remains were removed from her resting place and impaled with a stake and a cross. Um, what? Okay. Yeah, so people just start, like, going into Highgate and vandalizing and, th- and like, painting and graffitiing and trying to kill or keep this vampire at bay. At the same time, um, Ferret and Manchester are both kind of going through the media saying, oh, I've captured the vampire or I've killed it. Um, by 1973, uh, Ferret ends up getting arrested in a nearby churchyard because he has a crucifix and a wooden stake. 
And then mm. a, there is speculation that he perhaps was the person who was killing all the local neighborhood cats. Um, he was found not guilty of this, but it was enough to damage his reputation. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Manchester, meanwhile, in 1973, claimed that came out to the media, released a story saying that he had driven a stake through a vampire's heart uh, in nearby Crouch End, and he believed that it was the High Gate, High Gate vampire. So everything was fine now. Um, there's a lot more that went on with the jockeying for attention between Ferret and and Manchester. This is just a very high level summary. They they scheduled a duel once to see who was the better magi- magician. So just throwing that out there. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, there's some really interesting uh, documentaries about this Highgate vampire hysteria that you can find online. So if you want to learn more and also see some fabulous 70s fashion, I would totally recommend checking it out. But oh, how, you know I'm going to. How crazy is that though, right? Like in 1970s, like they're definitely a vampire. Like, I don't know about you, but I can definitely see like people being like people I know, even my, maybe even myself included being like, let's go out there. Let's take care of it. Vigilante yeah. supernatural justice, right? Exactly. <laughs> And that actually kind of leads up to my next question. So this is another true or false. Due to the Freedom of Information Act, the CIA website now has information on vampires, chakras, the effects of meditation, UFOs, and pretty much anything else you've assumed they've been hiding from us. I'm going to say that this is probably true because there's I can see people like filing like FOIA requests for shit like this. Yeah, it is absolutely true, Nicole. (laughs) So you can go to CIA.gov and go to the bottom of the page and click the Freedom of Information Act link, which will take you to the reading room. Everything is super redacted and there's not a lot of information, but there's still some information out there and it's all free to look at. Also, if you were curious, most of the vampire stuff seems to be in the Middle East for some reason. Weird. Yeah, don't know why. But yeah, like I just started typing in random things. I need to type in Bigfoot now just to see. But, <laughs> <Do> you know. <laughs> I'd be curious to see what you find out. I'm actually going to do it now. So what do you think about CAA.gov? I mean, I'm not surprised. All right. I'm on their webpage as we speak. Let's check this out and go for Bigfoot. Okay. This is about people pretending to be Bigfoot. <laughs> Yeah, there's not really anything on actual Bigfoot. So we're going to go and say that he's a big frog. And Alrighty, you heard it here first. But apparently vampires are real. So, According to the CIA, that. Bigfoot is fake, and, vampires are real. And according to people in the 70s as well. <laughs> That's super interesting. Although it's, it makes me wonder. It's like, yeah, I guess if you get like those reports and people are like, there's something suspicious going on, you have to do the due diligence, even if you're like, it's not a ghost, guys. It's this wild raccoon. Well, yeah, yeah. like the one that I saw, it was like possible vampire found, blah, 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 blah. Wow. Yeah. Weird. All right. For my next question, I feel like you're going to know this one because you're pretty good with languages, but. I haven't been so great at this so far, so let's hope. <laughs> So what supposed supernatural creature's name is German for the phrase double walker? Doppelganger? Yes, doppelganger. So I find doppelganger super fascinating and we haven't had a chance to talk about it. So I'm excited to to chat about it with you. So I know like double walker, doppelganger. I feel like now nowadays people will use doppelganger kind of. Lucy goosey where it's like oh my god i saw your doppelganger and it just means mm-hmm. like i saw somebody that looked like you and apparently there is like i forget like six percent of people that look exactly like you or something weird like that that i read online somewhere yes for certain people it's like common facial features and like that's a problem with uh, facial recognition software is that mm-hmm. if you fit if you were one of those people it's upwards of like six percent of the population could resemble you i'm like well that's terrifying yeah it is Almost as terrifying as the doppelganger legend. Exactly. So according to most legends, doppelgangers are, isn't just someone who resembles you or like a twin. It's actually a literal duplication of you. It's another you. Yep. And most people, uh, folklorists, I should say, and mystics believe that doppelgangers are supernatural creatures. And anytime you encounter a doppelganger or someone sees your doppelganger, it's almost never a good thing 
they're creatures heavily steeped in omen. I think um, as I was looking into doppelgangers more, there's lots of different legends about them. Um, sometimes it can be so, like, you know, about premonitions, almost functioning like that, that uh, woman in white or like a black mm-hmm. dog. Um, but most accounts say if you see your doppelganger or encounter your doppelganger, something bad will happen soon. Uh, there's lots of legends about people seeing their own doppelgangers, like Abraham Lincoln supposedly saw his doppelganger as a double reflection in a mirror, like with one uh, face next to an other face. He saw this Weird. three times, three times this happened to him. And now he's haunting the White House. I know. And his wife was like, well, maybe it means that you'll serve two terms, but that you'll die at the end of your second term. And lo and behold, he did. Accurate. Another cool doppelganger famous people thing uh, that I found, famous famous anecdote about a famous person that I found was about Catherine the Great. You know, I love myself, Miss Catherine the Great. And apparently later in her life, she was awoken one night by her servants who were frantic because they saw her plain as day sitting in her throne room and obviously she wasn't she was in bed so she accompanies them to the throne room and she finds her double her doppelganger sitting on the throne unresponsive uh she reportedly ordered ser- her servants to shoot the doppelganger and get oh rid my of it. god um a week later however catherine the great died uh, suddenly of a stroke oh so a lot of people think that this was a that a death omen that was foreshadowing Catherine the Great's uh, life. And then uh, uh, what if it wasn't Catherine the Great? What if the one that they killed in the throne was the real one? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> There's also some examples of doppelgangers being like just perhaps a vision of the future. Um, like the German author Goethe supposedly saw his doppelganger one day when he was riding through the woods. And then several years later, he realized that he was wearing the exact outfit and along the same road that he had seen his doppelganger years later. So he assumed that he had saw a vision of the future. Uh, I actually love Goethe. I love um, his version of uh, the doctor. Um, Dr. Faust. Faust. Yeah. Yeah. I like it better than the Marlowe one. I, I agree. I agree. It's just more Teutonic and brutal. Um, yes. <laughs> but yeah, he he had a doppelganger encounter. Um, and then another super creepy, creepy story about a doppelganger I read about was about the school teacher in, I believe it was Russia in like the, the, the uh, 1800s. And she was a very well-liked, beloved teacher, but she had had like 16 different postings in like 17 years of teaching. And the reason that she moved posting so much was because she would have this doppelganger that would appear to people. So there were stories about her returning to write on the chalkboard during class. And then like a woman who looked exactly like her would walk into the room and stare at the children. Or the woman would like mimic the teachers writing on the chalkboard, but facing the kids. Like how freaky is that? Uh, yeah. No, I don't like it. There's a story about how one time when she was eating in a staff cafeteria, uh, her doppelganger again appeared beside her and mimicked her as she ate her like food. I'm uh. like, oh uh, yeah. I'm like, uh. and there was also a, a, a story mentioned at one of her positions that she was outside with the children during presumably recess or something. And her doppelganger appeared in a classroom and again, just stood there and stared at the kids. I was like, that's spooky as hell, and I've never heard anything like that, but that was like the creepiest doppelganger thing I've ever that encountered. Is. That's <laughs> really creepy. And like I almost like a lot of these sound more like like a like a death omen or like an echo of some sort, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But that that one's real creepy, and I don't like that at all. <laughs> I know, I know. So yeah, doppelgangers. Hopefully you never encounter one. I hope not either. Thanks, Nicole. Now I'm going to have to be worried about that for the rest of my life. You're welcome. (laughs) Well, my next question for you is, in what state are you most likely to become the victim of a serial killer? Oh, man. This one's tough. Hmm. I'm going back and forth between like Florida and California, but I think I'm going to say California because I read a stat about how there's like quite a number of 
serial killers possibly operating in California. So I'm going to go with California. You're 100% correct, Nicole. Woohoo! The Golden State is the murder state. Yes, it is. So, <laughs> like, as the as of the end of last year, the total amount of serial killer victims in the state of California was 1,628. Holy shit! Texas was second on the list at 893. And third should be no surprise by how wacky it is there and because it was Nicole's other guest, but guess it would be Florida with 845. I feel like so many serial killers end up like taking a vacay in Florida at some point. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Our own state of Pennsylvania was number seven on the top 10 list with 420 victims. Mm. So that doesn't make me feel very safe, but no. you know. No, it does not. But if you. If you think about it for a moment, it's not much of a surprise that the answer would be California, because first off, California is the third largest state, with Texas being the second. So more people, more possible victims. Also, what do Richard Ramirez, Eileen Warnos, Charles Manson, Hillside Strangler, Golden Gate Killer, Randy Kraft, Ted Bundy, and a bunch of others all have in common besides being serial killers? They all killed in California. Mm. There's also a lot of people who, quote, won't be missed in that state as well. There's a lot of sex work, and everyone knows cops don't try as hard on those cases most of the time. There's lots of tourists who could easily just go missing and people won't know about it for a long while. Uh, lots of people going to L.A. to become stars, and maybe friends just think they're out there doing great things when really they've been dead this whole time because they're murdered by a fucking serial killer. Man, I feel like that totally is definitely a weird wrinkle that probably makes it easier for people to, to disappear in California too. Right. That whole idea oh, yeah. of like, you're going to like leave your little rinky dink hometown and go to Hollywood and be a star. Mm hmm. Mm. And then also if we're talking like Southern California, real easy getaway to Mexico, you know? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Or go hide in the desert like Manson wanted to do. Exactly. <laughs> It's interesting to me that Texas is the second state. Mm -hmm. like I know Texas is really big, but then I thought about, um, did you ever, have you ever heard of the Texas Killing Fields? Oh, it sounds familiar, but I'm not sure. It's, it's, it's this interesting area of Texas, Texas outside of, I think it's outside of Ga Galveston, but it's like 25 or 30 acres and it's just a place where people go and dump bodies. Like they found, they found like 30 people's remains since like the early seventies in this, this little area of Texas that kind of oh runs along a highway. Yeah. It's super fascinating. I wanted to look more into it and maybe we'll do that in a future, a future refuel. Um, but yeah, it was, it's totally bizarre. And a lot of law enforcement believe that this site is being used by multiple serial killers to dump bodies. That wouldn't surprise me. And this, I think I've heard about this, but I think it was fairly recently that I heard about it. Um, but yeah, I, I do remember that name at least. Mm -hmm. And that's just really creepy. And now I want to go there and just start digging and be like, hey, police, I found a body. Oh, found another one. Found another one. Solve I these know. crimes. I know. It's crazy. Okay. My my last question for you, Eden, is about cryptids. Okay. Let's go. What cryptid stalks the New Jersey Pine Barrens gobbling up livestock with a hellish appetite? Has to be the Jersey Devil, right? Ding, ding, ding. Yes, the Jersey Devil. Um, I feel like this one was like, like a close to home story. I, I don't know about you, but I, I'm assuming, you know, just being in the area of the country that we're in, the Jersey Devil is one of the first legendary creatures you kind of learn about. Oh, I've, yeah, I've known about the Jersey Devil since I was like real little. Yeah, but did you know that sometimes it's called the Leeds Devil? No. So I, when I was researching the Jersey Devil to learn a little bit more about it, I came across this whole, I wouldn't say hidden history, but I would say unknown history to most people. So the Jersey Devil, just a level set, is always described as this like really weird bipedal kangaroo-like or wyvern-like creature. Yeah, it's it has weird. Like, it has like a ram's head or a goat head, sometimes a horse head I've seen. Like two little like cloven hoof legs that it like hops around on and then like yeah, to me it looks like a fucked up kangaroo yes with like bat wings <laughs> yes <laughs> the little tiny kangaroo arms like meow, meow, gonna get you um 
And then the devil part comes from the fork, the, uh, aside from the cloven hooves, but also from like a forked tail, I guess, as well. Yeah. Um, it's always described as super fast and that it has like a really high pitch, like blood curdling scream when people encounter it. But the folklore where the Jersey devil is also called the Leeds devil goes back to like the colonial era. Um, sometime the Jersey devil is the legend goes that uh, he was born uh, to a woman who was known as mother Leeds, mm-hmm. who had 12 children. And when she found out she was pregnant for the 13th time, cursed the child in frustration, saying that the child would be a devil because it was bedeviling her. And it said that on a stormy night in 1735, Mother Leeds gave birth to the Jersey Devil. Um, It was a normal child at first, but then it began to change, growing hooves and a goat's head, bat wings and a forked tail. Eventually, um, it escaped the house by flying up the chimney and disappearing into the pines. Yeah. Um, Some versions of the tale say that Mother Leeds was actually a witch and that the child's father was the devil himself. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then there's also um, a bunch of stories about how local clergymen would try to exercise the Jersey devil or the Leeds devil from the Pine Barrens. Um, Interestingly, so there is actually some historical like grounding for Mother Leeds, which is nuts to me. No. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Talk about, you know, the victor controlling the narrative, right? So in colonial New Jersey, 